Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. We're going to begin first today with the new uh, long-range European forecast data that was just released on the 5th, and uh, that looks out over the next several months. And to understand that forecast, we need to remember that some of these long-range forecasts are, are very sensitive to some of the inputs, one being uh, the, the pattern at the point that the model was initialized, uh, second being the soil moisture uh, issues going on in the model, and then the third being the ocean temperatures. And so we're going to look at all of those things real quick and then get to the data. So we've been staring here at the U.S. Drought Monitor released in the morning on Thursday. And a couple of things to point out, we still have a substantial portion of the United States in drought. And I'm, as I've stated so many times, the area that I'm very concerned about primarily is going to be the Southern Plains. Let's go take a look, a quick look at the change map. And just over the last week, it's important to note that that big winter storm that went racing through parts of North Carolina producing a lot of heavy rain here and some severe weather and then the snow in Virginia which was very problematic in this region uh, did give that area a one class improvement on the drought but we saw the drought uh, getting worse in the lower Mississippi River Valley in Texas and parts of the uh, southern plains we look back over the last three months and that's been the area that I've really stressed that I'm most concerned about moving forward in this forecast so the soil moisture here is low it's lower than average on here as well and that's getting ingested into the long-range forecast models. All right. The second, you know, kind of big predictor that's in those models is ocean temperatures. And we've had quite a discussion about this as of late. A couple of big factors to think about. Uh, one, we still have quite a bit of cold water in the Gulf of Alaska, and this is a major wild card with the upcoming pattern. Two, our La Nina is now very much what I would call east-focused over here in Nino Region One plus two, and over in Nino Region Three, we've actually seen a return almost back to normal ocean temperatures in Nino Region Four. And tucked in the middle, right in through here, we have what's called Nino Region 3.4. Okay, so that's what's going on with our La Nina. Discussed that on Monday, very much east focused. We have the uh, negative phase of the PDO, and that's what you really see with the cold water in place in the Gulf of Alaska and the warm water that's here. That's what that negative PDO signature looks like. And just remembering, we're still in the positive phase of the Atlantic multi decadal oscillations. So we still have quite a bit of warm water in the North Atlantic. All right, so that's what the models were initialized with. And therefore, they're going to carry the historical, um, you know, forcings of those particular weather events. And what I'm saying here is that we look back over the last seven years when we've had drought like this or when we've had ocean temperatures like that, and we get a forecast that looks kind of something like this. We can start on the temperature side of things. We built up a massive storehouse of cold air here in the Canadian prairie. And now that we're starting to get uh, some ridging over the west coast, it's just getting pushed out and it's come through. In fact, we got large region here of wind chill warnings in this area just here tonight on, um, you know, on, on Thursday night when I'm recording this kind of late. And by the way, I'm sorry I'm coming to you so late. Uh, many of you probably know that uh, the Nomads server, that's the one that gives us like the GFS and so many other weather forecast model data. It's had a lot of problems uh, over the last few days and I thought I had some of those problems resolved, but it turns out I didn't. So tonight, this is going to be a purely European model forecast for you, okay? But anyways, again, you're looking here at January temperatures. Uh, but it's interesting. As we go from January into February, the model really just backs off on that, the extent of that cold air, keeping it in the northern plains and in the Canadian prairie and starts to return quite a bit of mild air in this region. Now, to be honest, uh, kind of an east-focused La Nina would suggest that would happen. Plus, remember, this region was very mild throughout December. It's only just been lately that it's gotten cold. And you go from February to March, and you actually see some expansion of that, which I know we're going to yank the groundhog out of its cage here in, what, about a month, and be interesting to see what it calls for in terms of spring weather, because it looks as though as we get into March and even into April, there's kind of some mild conditions being forecast currently by the model. Now, uh, before we go look at... Um, before we go look at the ocean temperatures again, I'm going to take you back. Let's just get back here again. Let's flip this over to precipitation. And what I want to do instead of looking at just one month at a time, let's look at the next three months together, January, February, March. An interesting thing is this track right in through here. That's very common when there is still quite cold water, both in the Gulf of Alaska and also in, um, in the uh, Nina region one plus two. But we've kind of expanded this a bit farther to the east, suggesting we're going to see a lot of systems that will likely come through this trajectory. Uh, we saw, of course, we're watching one right now on Thursday night that'll end up here Friday morning. Um, what I will be most interested in seeing is if the models have correctly identified 
this region is continuing to stay drier. Now to keep that area dry, you've gotta have deep troughs that kinda of cut in like this, and you get westerly winds here that then eject into a low pressure system there. That's what would make this pattern happen. So the flow of the atmosphere of the jet stream would have to do this. But if we get any sense of a subtropical jet developing at any time, then this forecast is tossed out the window. Now, just because we can, not because there's really any skill in this, but why don't we just see where it goes forward, just to get an idea. So this will be a one month sliding, or th excuse me, a three month sliding window. We're gonna add a month at a time. So January, February, March, this is February, March, April. And then this would be March, April, May. And as we get out here now into, you know, fully into spring, April, May, and June, the models continue just to favor drier conditions in parts of the central high plains and southern plains. And it is suggesting from maybe the Red River Valley of the south through the Ohio River Valley and all of the Midwest at possibly having an above average spring in terms of precipitation. Now just remember, we're way far out there in the forecast. We are purely viewing this as raw model output, no meteorological analysis. And the reason why I say that, why no meteorological analysis looking out this far at spring, is because of that other thing I want to talk to you about, and that was the ocean temperatures. And to see those, we got to blow this out to an equatorial view. You see, let's take it back here. We notice that our La Nina is peaking in January here after already reaching a peak in December out in the Central Pacific, right? And then, sorry, as we go forward, that La Nina fades as expected. So by March, and then April, May, and June, we actually start to see some warmer water showing up here. Now, if the atmosphere goes over into a Nino-like state, okay, now what does that mean? Instead of having strong trade winds here, we've got weaker trade winds, or maybe even those trade winds start to reverse a little bit. And that really affects a subtropical jet. That affects the polar jet. I mean, it really cranks up our spring pattern if that were to occur. The other part of this is, if there's a lot of warm water here, now I'm gonna think way long-term just for, just for the sake of it. This is still part of the positive phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. And if that AMO stays positive, and we have a maybe an El Nino developing here, the issue becomes, as we look out there longer term, that we might be talking about um, you know, seeing a hurricane season that could be affected by high wind shear. So I'll be watching that carefully. That's, I think, the things we need to be thinking about overall. But this La Nina is, is, is fading right now. In fact, we can take a look at that by going over here and uh, getting an idea about the um, those different regions. So you see that they're all starting to warm up January through May. That's Nina region 1 plus 2. That's right next to South America. Go out there into the Central Pacific, Nina region 3.4, same thing. So most of these models are suggesting that by the time we get to the end of spring, we're looking at warm anomalies in the Pacific Ocean, um, or, or at least near zero. So this La Nina, which would be the second in a row, seems to be kind of on its on its last legs. Now I come back to one other thing before we go into maybe a little bit more of a near term, and it has to deal with this drought issue. Uh, if we just go back here, let's just go back and look at the uh, original drought monitor. I was looking and I wanted to know what the drought looked like here a year ago in winter. And so I just went back and took a look at that. And it was much more extensive over parts of the four corner states in the, in the desert southwest and very intense in western Texas. So we were actually in deeper drought a year ago in this area. But remember, spring came along, it was very wet here, cool throughout summer. This drought really just redeveloped in the last three months. And we had a very powerful southwestern monsoon last summer. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that while we look at these long range forecasts and what they suggest, um, just remember that their skill uh, is not high. There are some years they're very accurate, in other words, they get it right, but repeated accuracy is skill, and they're just not, they're not overly skillful. That's difficult to forecast out that far. All right, so we've taken a look at that, and now I want to get more into the near term here. Now, when we look at the flow of the atmosphere, we're always trying to balance what's going on in the tropics versus what's going on in the subtropics versus what's going on in the polar latitudes, okay? So just moving north from the equator. And I wanna show you some of the way by which we assess that polar, the polar latitudes by looking at these teleconnections. These are just index values. I mean, some of you probably follow the stock market carefully. You know how we often look at index values to tell us how the stock market's doing? Same thing, this just tells us how the atmosphere's doing. And we're looking, you've been looking at the Arctic Oscillation, which is a surface pressure pattern between the Arctic and the, and the, polar, uh, and the mid latitudes. And look at this. Beyond about the 13th of the month, the spread in the model's large, and it averages out at zero. 
That's one of the oscillations. How about the East Pacific Oscillation? This is one that looks there kind of in the Gulf of Alaska. It's flat. I mean, it spreads out. Look at that spread, but it sits right on average. The North Atlantic Oscillation. This is the one that looks at a pressure pattern kind of near um, Greenland, uh, that area. Okay, we're doing this now, and then it too, the average flattens out, but the spread is large. The Pacific North American pattern, okay, negative now. Big ridge coming in, that's right here in the near term, but it flattens out. And even the West Pacific Oscillation, it's way negative, but it's coming back up here. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is, we're losing some skill even in the near term forecasts as well. And since these indicators, which are all dealing with the polar branch of the jet stream, seem to flatten out, I gotta go back to the tropics again. And this is what I'm seeing in the tropics, starting to get a signal again. Do you see, as we go forward in time, again, here's today, through the next 15 days, that we have this eastward propagating region of downwelling. This is air sinking, uh, this is air um, subsidence in the atmosphere. And it ends up over South America, and you better believe that next video we're gonna talk about is gonna discuss what this means for South America. But if the MJO starts to move around, while the trade winds, are still quite a bit of a mess. Although we do start to see here, look at this rising motion happening over MJO phase eight initially, then over to phase one. You see, that tells me that maybe the strongest signal we've got right now is coming out of the tropics. And if we look what's going on with the MJO, let's blow this up a little bit. It's been in high uh, amplitude phase seven, which we know was a reflection of the subsidence in phase three, but it seems to be moving out. Could get over here weekly into phase eight or collapse back toward null space, which is here. I, I keep trying to convince myself that maybe the solution is right. It's going to move into the Western Pacific. That may happen, or excuse me, the Central Pacific. And I want to show you what this means, okay? Because we're firmly into January now. And if it stays in phase seven, we tend to get ridges that form here in the Gulf of Alaska. The flow comes around like this and deep troughs. We got this going on right now. Then a big ridge that builds up toward Greenland. But if we do get over into phase eight, look at the difference here. We tend to hang on to our much colder air east in all of North America. This is a drier pattern for the west. It's a mild pattern for the west. It's a drier pattern for the southern plains because the flow comes over and down. It doesn't start to get active until it makes that turn back. And I'll come back to this again at the end of the video, but look at the troughing developing here over parts of Europe. That's critical right now to the temperature forecast there. I think right now that most of the forcing in the long range models are coming from the tropics, that ocean temperature pattern in the MJO. And I think it's showing up as a reflection in the jet stream pattern. In other words, the tropics are largely still influencing the jet stream pattern. So here you go. By the time we get to the third week of January, that's the ridge that's associated with MJO phase seven and eight. See the downstream trough? As we play this forward, it just kind of tends to stay that way. Maybe at the beginning of February, we push the ridge back out. Now this is where it was all December, so look what it does. The flow comes back around like that and then runs up over a southeastern ridge. Now you know that pattern well. This was all of December for us. But watch, as we kind of go forward, it kind of wants to go back again. See that? We start seeing this trough, this, these lower heights I should say, shifting. And therefore this long range forecast has got a little bit of a, it's got an interesting flavor to it. And I'm gonna show you the precipitation side of it first. So why don't we just leave it there? This would be um, February, or, uh, January 21st to February 21st. And the dryness you see here is due to the ridge. The flow coming into the west, again, if the flow comes in with troughs like that and then they eject into the Ohio River Valley, this is a wetter forecast that hits not only here from the mid-south and midwest, but over to the mid-Atlantic and then up into the northeast, which is why we could see some correction on the drought situation here. But I don't see strong precipitation anomalies there. And this temperature pattern that we're gonna experience, let's just go look at the next 30 days. It favors a lot of cold air coming out at times, running across the Great Lakes. I think that the month of January is gonna be a pretty epic month for lake effect snow folks. Uh, this, this is gonna be good. But I think we're a bit too cold here. I think we're gonna see more ridging keeping that area mild. I do buy into this. I think from Texas all the way over to the Southeast is also gonna see mild conditions because if we end up developing a, a sense of that subtropical ridge, then that, that's going to be important to keeping that region warm. So what I tried, tried to kind of prove to you today was that the polar jet stream seems to still be really connected to what's going on in the tropics. 
And as the tropics begin to shift, they're going to change things quite a bit for us. So I don't have a lot of confidence right now in the long range forecast. And that's kind of where I wanted to get to today. So let's take a look at the near term. Our all hazards web map, let's shrink that up so you can see it, still shows us into the evening here what's going on on the back side of that low that's just racing here toward the east coast. Now what we're going to see here is we've got winter storm warning still in place where it's snowing right now as I'm recording this in parts of western Kentucky getting into Virginia. Uh, excuse me, eastern Kentucky, excuse me. And then we did uh, increase the winter storm warnings up along the coast because this system's going to hug the coast and bring some snow inland. But you look downwind of the Great Lakes, a lot of lake effect snow is going to be happening here, and there's some really cold air coming in. Just a reminder, we're still under 4% of the Great Lakes being covered by ice, and that's well below average. And also, don't forget, we still have a system coming into the Pacific Northwest right now. Uh, so let's go look at all of this. First, Snowfall. This is what we've already had. This was through uh, 7 p.m. this evening or 6 p.m. this evening on Thursday. So we, we put down quite a bit of heavy snow into this area. And then this, of course, was the system, the blizzard that went through, uh, you know, Red River Valley of the north and put down big snows here in northern Wisconsin in the UP. This system, though, moved very fast. And by tomorrow morning, when a lot of you are going to be watching this, it'll already be offshore. But these snowfall amounts here, now this is only three days worth. We got some places that picked up four feet, and they had four feet before that in the Cascades. So we have packed the snow into the Western Mountains, and I'll show you the, what the comparison to average is here in just a few moments. But when a lot of you will be watching this on uh, Friday, midday, this is what we're going to see. The low is already here off the coast of Maine. A lot of cold air coming in behind it. Lake effect snow going. High pressure sits here. And if you notice, the flow coming right up out of the south, rebounding really bring it in. You'll see the temperatures in a few moments. Strong winds throughout the Columbia Basin, see it up here, and into the Intermountain West. That's what we're going to be seeing on the day on Friday. Now today, I can only show you the European model because we're having trouble getting the GFS data from the Nomad server. So let's just take a look at some of the big features. The jet stream right now is, is unblocked for the most part. we got a pretty zonal, more west to east flow to it, uh, and it's moving. So as we go through the day on Thursday and on Friday, and I work our way into the week, and we got another deep trough that comes in by Monday. That's going to push a front through, pull in some Gulf moisture, make some more rain for parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley into the Ohio River Valley, and then off to the east. But what I'm interested in on Monday is this thing right here, a little cutoff low in California, just off California. Now watch this. Getting into Monday night and Tuesday, that cutoff low stays there. See how the flow's north of it? And then it eventually kind of pulls in over Mexico and runs under this ridge. See the ridge here? And then comes out into New Mexico, Texas. Let me get that back there for you. And that would be fantastic. And the reason why is this will introduce moisture back into parts of Texas. So let's go see what the European models got for this. So I was out there looking at it before I recorded. Let's go back in time and start this here. Uh, 6 a.m. Friday morning. That low is already off the coast. Heavy snows on the backside here, possibly some ice mixed in. We have another coastal low coming in here into parts of the um, northwest. And like I said, high pressure came in. Clear skies, very cold overnight lows with some strong winds in here. Now, this is as we work our way through the day. That high pressure cell moves east. See it? What was that winter storm that came into the northwest, again, adding more snow, sends a little short wave here toward Lake Winnipeg, brings some light snow with it. But if that high pressure cell moves this direction, what we end up doing on the back side of it is just pulling the weather and the wind out of the south. It will be very windy in this corridor, very windy, as we work our way through Friday into Saturday morning. And that's going to open up some Gulf moisture. And what happens is there's a low here, and that low is going to bring a front right in through this area. It's going to meet up with the flow around this high, and we're just going to get scattered showers, possibly some storms in this area. No, I don't think they're going to be severe at this point, but we could get some heavy rain and possibly some you know, locally strong storms here. This is now overnight hours on Saturday, getting into Sunday morning. And as that front just plows on through, brings in um, you know, a good chance at rain for the East Coast. And the behind it, see it right in through here, we got some more snow for parts of eastern West Virginia, excuse me, eastern Kentucky, and then West Virginia again. This is a possibility uh, getting into the overnight hours on Sunday to early Monday morning. Now that clears out. And after that, there's high pressure that's in here. So getting out to next Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the next thing I'm watching is that cutoff low, which was here, moved across Mexico. And look at this. We're bringing some moisture in early next week to a region that desperately needs to see it. So that's Wednesday evening, getting into Thursday. And we're going to have to stop it right about there because we're going to lose kind of some accuracy in the model at this point. So those are the things I'm watching most carefully. And it's kind of stitched together with a couple other maps. 
snowfall. So this again is from the 12Z run. So we saw this already falling into this area. You can see along the coast here, two to six inches locally heavier snowfall amounts there. Next big storm system comes into the Cascades. Look at that, it's gonna add another possibly 25 to 40 inches of snow here. It even pushes into the Northern Rockies. And then remember that little clipper comes out. But if we just kind of keep playing this forward, I'll just take you out here all the way through a week. Uh, again, we just kind of see out here, there's a large area that's missing out on this. Lake effect snow will really get going here. Uh, and I want to show you that this is an area, there's some places in here that are really missing out on the snow. Take a look at these two maps. This first map looks at uh, through January 6th of this year, snowfall departures from normal. So we've had some big snows in the upper Midwest, but look at New England, look at the Midwest. Uh, I know the color bar washes out this, but we have places in here that haven't even seen snow yet. Um, we're way above average in the Western mountains, okay, way above average here. But maybe an easy way to look at this is this map. What this one's showing you is percent of normal. So that was departure in terms of inches. Everywhere that you've got this solid red, those are places that have not yet measured snow at all. And uh, we've had some big systems cutting through the Mid-South into the Mid-Atlantic, but there's a lot of areas. In fact, I heard someone this evening commenting, it's snowing more to our South than it is over us in Illinois. And this just, again, gives you some perspective on what we've seen so far in snow. Now, from there, I'm going to go back and talk about precip over the next week. And we see here that there's our current system going through. Next one coming into the northwest. Clipper cuts through here. We then open up the gulf, push on it with a front. That's what adds the precipitation into this area. As we just play the sun out, we do know we go a little bit drier for most of the country into week two. But remember, watching that cutoff. Watch it right there. Spread rain into the southern plains. That would be fantastic. So I'm going to keep a close eye on all of that. But overall, when we just put the next week together into a single map, this is what we've got in terms of precipitation anomalies from the 12Z ECMWF. In California, to parts of the Midwest, we're going to be seeing some regions in here showing up drier than average because of the way this pattern's setting up. From there, let's get out there and just look at what happens beyond week one. You see, we get out here into week two, and as that little low pulls through this area, I see that getting out here, this would be day four through day seven, got a trough extending in this area, and then pulling all this uh, forecast data out to the end of week two, we get here. So this particular setup could increase rainfall in this area, keeping cold air more often here, drier in the west, but let's just go take a look at it. As we play this out into week two, there it is. You see we got this active kind of southern tip of that trough right in through this area showing up wet. We're dry in the west coast because of the ridge. And it's calling for near normal in the midsection of the country, but there's just such large model spread. That's what we've got. From here, let's go talk about temperatures because as I was recording this pretty late in the evening here on Thursday, boy, there's some brutally cold air that's extended out of the Canadian prairie all the way through the Midwest, and that front's dipping really far to the south. Where we expect this to go is, well, we've already seen Thursday's highs. Let's get to Friday. That cold air is going to move east on Friday, but you saw it. The, the winds are going to start to return from the south here in the southern plains. Look at that by Saturday. Big warm up here. But it's pretty short lived. Got our next shot at cold air coming in with that clipper system that rolls up into Lake Winnipeg. There's the front. And that front slides through on Monday, bringing in really cold air back to uh, parts of the upper Midwest. But this volatile temperature pattern just keeps bouncing. There's next Tuesday into Wednesday. So we keep returning some of that mild air in place. Now, day t uh, five through 10. So we're looking out here at about the, the, the 16th. That would be the time period where we get the most mild air coming through the Canadian prairie. But this pattern seems to be a bit transitory and even retrograding at times. So the day 10 through 15, which gets us out to the 21st, returns that colder air as things back up a bit farther to the west. What is not happening right now, and no, I didn't get this right at the end of December, is the polar vortex. It's very strong. It's sitting right here over Greenland. It's gonna migrate back over the Arctic. The more these things look like a donut, and the wind's fast, the stronger they are, and the tighter their grip is on the cold air. We even see here in the forecast that the strength of those zonal winds is very high compared to average, whereas last year we were already watching a major disruption in the polar vortex. See the blue line there? That's what was happening last year. It came to a head in, in February. We're not there yet. But there is one thing I want to point out, and I'm going to watch this carefully. If that MJO phase 8 takes over and this ridge sets up, I'd be very concerned about seeing the eastern part of North America and possibly much of Western Europe going over quite cold. 
And if those two large population centers have um, you know, cold anomalies at any point through January or February, if they time up at the same time with that, that's going to put substantial demand on, uh, on heating. And so just something I want you all to be watching, and I'll be watching it too. Hey, have a great rest of your week. Talk to you again on Monday. Thanks.